Okay, recording starting. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today. I am Jordan Roberts, your host. I'm joined today by Wayne Griffenberg. This is our Friday HSM Hangout. We do this same place, same time, every week, new content. And traditionally, we are laser focused on providing you guys with you know, tips and tricks inside of the HSM software. We're still going to do that today, but special topic today, we've got the future of making things. This is a 100,000 foot view as to uh, where disruption could potentially come from in a competitive environment and how do you separate yourself from that. It's a great topic, but first, a couple housekeeping items. As most of you know, next week we have the big IMTS show in Chicago. And Autodesk, as you guys obviously know, has the digital manufacturing group. Um, this group here is going to be showcased at IMTS. And we have a couple of really special events. This one right here, if you guys are going to be in Chicago, let us know. And we, we would really encourage you to stop by the Haas booth. Autodesk and Haas have partnered together. It's the first time ever. And that's, it's going to be a huge deal. We're going to have free beer. We're going to have food. It's going to be amazing. I also got a VIP event that's outside of this event. If you guys are going to be there and you want to come meet us and participate in this VIP event, send me an email. It's just jordan.roberts at autodesk.com. I'll get you on that list. Space is limited, so please only sign up if you truly intend on making it. Um, if you have an interest in it, we'll give you more information. But again, it is a VIP event. Everybody is welcome, but space is limited. So please let us know. Um, really quickly, I want to know who is going to be there. So if you're going to be at IMTS, please submit your votes. The polls are open. Your choices are I wish or I'll see you there, and um, you're going to stop by the booth. We'll have computers set up. You guys can play with Inventor HSM. We're going to have some members of the team there as well. You'll get to meet the product manager, Al Wutmo. So if there's something you want to see in Inventor HSM, HSM Works for SolidWorks, or Fusion 360, which for those of you that don't know, um, it's, it's the next generation CAD CAM tool it has collaboration tool simulation. It's an incredible tool. Um, you should definitely pick up a few licenses of that as well just because it is so affordable being cloud-based um, to complement your Inventor HSM and your HSM works installs. So great. Thanks for voting, everybody. Appreciate that. Um, looks like 88% of our crowd wishes they could be there and 12% will actually be there. So we're excited to meet everybody at the booth. And again, that VIP event, that's going to be something just phenomenal. So the future of making things, FOMT, that you might see FOMT all over the place when you're looking at Autodesk content. But what is the future? That's what we're going to talk about today. So what are the trends? What are the challenges? Especially, this is what's most interesting, where is the opportunity? So what are we going to discuss? FOMT, the future? Well, let's get right back to the why. So adapting to new trends and developments, that's vital for our existence as job shops, understanding how to stay relevant. Where is our competition coming from? Is it down the street or the person down the street halfway around the world? We can start right now to think about you know, what's going to take place in the future. So I'd like to go back to the 80s when hopefully some of us were, were alive. And before we start talking about it, I just want to reflect on the future and what we saw and what this movie actually might have brought to our existence today. So in 1989, you know, we've got this hoverboard with a pair of Nikes that are self-lacing. And then fast forward to 2014, uh, <laughs> we see Buzz Aldrin. This is this is Buzz Aldrin standing on a hoverboard at Autodesk. Uh, pretty incredible stuff. 
as we all know, the past predicts the future, and Lexis announces something similar, um, and we're seeing safety notices. <laughs> so now at the Autodesk offices, there's actually a safety notice that went out on 12-21-2015 that, you know, alerting us to the safety concern of hoverboards. Now, not everybody is using a hoverboard at Autodesk, but take a look at this. Those same shoes from Back to the Future were made by Nike, and they're self-lacing. I think they sold for around 5,000 um, pounds. Anyways, it was a limited run, but the theme here is that the future is here. So Star Trek, you know, they predicted a lot of the future as well with video conferencing. And today, everybody's familiar with this. In fact, this is how we're hosting this meeting today. Um, look at Captain Kirk. The similarities here are just absolutely striking. Um, Captain Kirk and, and the uh, former CEO of Apple both using iPods, or iPads, rather. And then uh, Johnny Cab, Wayne, you were telling me that you watched this movie the other night. That's a total recall. Great movie. Yeah. And so, you know, the concept of a self-driving car, well, that's here today. And we're seeing this at Tesla. We're seeing this at BMW. Volvo is doing self-driving semis. And there's so much to discuss about uh, existing technologies and, and how those trends are going to change our current lives. Here, uh, we've got the, what is this, the materializer from Scott Star Trek, Wayne? That's what it looks like, I believe. The replicator. That's, yep, the replicator. Yeah, the replicator. Yeah. So, it, you know, this is a device that basically is, you know, the foreshadowing of 3D printing. And on the right, you have the Ember product. If you guys don't know, Autodesk has an open source 3D printing platform. It's all open source, all of it. And the whole movement of open source is another shift in uh, the world of manufacturing where your intellectual property is shared and, and the crowdsourced. Really what's coming, <laughs> what we think about here is what we need to realize is that the speed at which technology is changing is increasing exponentially. Um, and that's happened on a fairly fast timeline. So you can see here, relatively static and, until we, we get up into here and it becomes really dynamic. And you know when, when, the, when the automobile was invented, somebody went out there and bought 8,000 horses. You know, so as we're thinking about our machine shops, our job shops, the way that we manufacture, and where the where the disruption is coming from, um, ladies and gentlemen, we're we're out we're way up in here. You can't even see where we're at today. And with cloud computing, the the speed at which technology is progressing is is really approaching exponential growth. Here's a snapshot of the DeLorean and from Back to the Future. But what what I want to realize from that shot is that the future is now. It's here. So traditional strategies, you know, how, how do you separate yourself from the competition? Uh, the one thing that all of our manufacturing customers share in common is that they're all seeking some form of competitive advantage. So what separates them from other manufacturers in the marketplace? The, the problem is that there's new disruptive trends in the market that are shortening the time a manufacturer has to enjoy any advantage in that marketplace. And we group these trends in three broad categories. So the first one's productivity. And so we need to optimize productivity in two ways. One, input. So we need to lower our production costs, which is our overhead, our material, our labor. And two, uh, output, higher output. So in our world, that's the HSM component of it. That's the high-speed machining. That's that integrated CAD CAM workflow. And we can automate, we can optimize, and um, you know, that's going to be effective. But we also need to look at um, innovation and where that innovation is coming from. We need to continually innovate the design of the products to maintain that competitive edge um, or disrupt the market and create an entirely new category of product that's uniquely positioned to satisfy customer, customer demand, which is also rapidly transforming. So we're, when I think about customer demand, I think about mass production versus mass customization. And so uh, we'll get into that a little bit later. But also, uh, only momentary market differentiation, IP, patents. This is only a temporary advantage and process. So new methods and process, uh, unique and highly advantageous 
Uh, we got new techniques and capabilities, and and you know again you see this with this integrated CAD CAM workflow compared to uh, you know what has traditionally been the status quo for the CAM market for the last 20, 30 years. And for anyone that's leveraged HSM technology in their business, they can most likely attest to what that workflow is like, especially when you have uh, engineering change orders or mass personalization. And some of the Kickstarters that we're seeing are leveraging HSM technology today, and we're just seeing phenomenal, phenomenal disruption and products coming from that competitive separation and disruptive trends. And you know, what are those trends? And you know, the trends that are affecting these traditional outcomes, well, they're having an impact on the marketplace today. And so as we discuss productivity, innovation, and process, uh, the status quo is being disrupted by these industry forces and technologies. And, and that's really what's reshaping our world and our environment and how things are designed and made and then produced. And you know what? We live our lives in the MIG portion of the product innovation platform, which we also refer to as PIP, along with the F-O-M-T um, in initialism there. But really what it comes down to is demand, because without demand, there really isn't a need for a product. So the, this is the third form of disruption, and this is uh, capturing the different ways in which the customer expectations have increased and continue to increase uh, very rapidly over time. So customers are expecting products that meet higher levels of performance and efficiency and adapt. And you know what? We're moving from this idea of planned obsolescence where products have a life cycle and then they're retired. Well, that will still happen. but. Uh, the, the products that are going to provide the most value to consumers in the future are the ones that are getting better over time. It's kind of an inverse uh, paradigm, if you will. And number two, uh, you know, the, these not only do customers expect these products to get better over time, they expect these products to be tailored to their unique set of requirements. This is a tremendous challenge for a manufacturer where we, in the past, we've thought about ways to make the most amount of things for the most amount of people, but in one way or maybe a few variations of that one flavor. Um, but as we'll see in the next example, uh, what mass customization really means for the marketplace, especially when you're looking at demand fragmenting geographies and generational lines. Um, everyone knows about the millennials. This, this is a truly wide open opportunity for manufacturers to take advantage of data and to leverage how certain geographies will, uh, will adopt different products and how those different products can be customized for those own geographies and in turn allow manufacturers to not only charge a premium for those products, but uh, better satisfy the demand. So really, just to, just to reiterate, reiterate here, demand is growing and changing. And with the rise of economic prosperity around the world, largely due to uh, access of the internet. 2.5 billion people have access to it. That's exponentially growing every day. Um, this means that we're simultaneously more connected and educated about products before we make a purchase, about the uh, choices that we have, the aesthetic, the personalization, the sustainability aspect of it, how these things are manufactured and where, what those customer expectations are. Uh, Tesla, another great example. Everyone has probably heard of Tesla. They've been in the news quite a bit recently, not only for their electric vehicles, but their SpaceX program, their exploration into uh, batteries and storage for your home. Uh, how will that disrupt the utilities? Um, an incredible time that we're moving into right now. And all that, again, is, is driven off of demand. So mass customization, moving away from mass production and moving into mass personalization. Here we have a company. It's a wearable technology where we have uh, earbuds that fit your exact ear, but not only that, you can customize the color and really make them your own. This allows the manufacturer to obviously charge a premium for the same product 
uh, that you know might not necessarily get as much cash at the point of sale. And getting back to Tesla and this whole idea of having a product that provides more value over time. In owning a vehicle, now I'm a car guy, I've bought and sold over 30 vehicles in my lifetime. I absolutely am in love with the idea of having a self-driving car, potentially on subscription and getting rid of the maintenance component, or better yet, not having to worry about going to the mechanic because my car updates itself and you know when there's an issue, it, I can be alerted of the issue and just set a time for it to solve that issue. And as for the manufacturer, the value is that you can avoid costly recalls, very, very costly recalls, and just fix the problem with a simple firmware update. Um, yes, they've captured consumer interest in the sustainable, intelligent product design, but they're also following a business model that could disrupt the entire automotive industry as we know it today. Um, they don't expect customers to buy a new car every year. They expect that product to get better over time. And uh, you know, when we saw Tesla in the news for uh, the car fire uh, based on the battery, it was able to improve the performance and uh, with a simple firmware update. Now just, just truly truly phenomenal how this manufacturer was able to avoid a very costly recall. So demand is growing. It's changing. With the rise of economic prosperity around the world, our consumers are more educated and they want tailor-made products. And so the next generation of consumer is coming to market. And that demand is driving how we manufacture and what changes we need to make in order to stay relevant and in order to compete in a modern economy. The aesthetic, the personalization, the sustainability aspect of it. You know, people want to buy products that have been manufactured close to them. Look at Toyota. They make their vehicles in the United States. They're great vehicles as well. Um, customer expectations changing. And a large part of this, the software that they expect in many products is, is improving as well over time. Uh, so what we're seeing also in software is that the cost to get into this technology is being democratized. Uh, that is due to the cost of computing power being dramatically reduced every single day. You know, and then look at population. In 20, there's over 7 billion people in the world today. By 2050, the population is going to be close, it's projected to be close to 9.6 billion people. Those are 9.6 billion potential customers for our products, for our manufacturing products, because they that's another consumer, that's another person that needs a pair of sunglasses, that's another person that's going to want to drive a car, it's another person that's going to have a connected mobile device in the Internet of Things. And for those of you that are following what Autodesk is doing in the world of IoT, if you're not, I highly recommend it. We have some incredible technology that is going to really bring some phenomenal innovation to the, not only the manufacturing space, but the consumer space as well. This is going to, this growing population is going to empower um, the, the product development and consumer demand. And, you know, getting back, mass personalization, guys, that's really where the key is here. That's, that's where the future is at. And you know what? We're seeing it today. We have this idea of the market of one, the idea that creating unique value for customers through this mass customization is what's going to allow us to, one, try a higher price for our product, and two, better serve and satisfy that consumer demand. Now, I apologize. This is a lot, but this is a very exciting topic for us because products are becoming more intelligent. When you hear of the Internet of Things and that saying, if walls could talk, well, in the future, they most likely will be able to. We will have smart devices, smart cars, smart technology, sensors are becoming so affordable that we can embed those into our daily lives in fabrics and materials that we've never seen before. It's no surprise that these products are connected, they're networked. It's, it's, uh, it's true across all industries. All that data that, we're, that is being gathered and collected is going to add value to our lives and as a consumer allow us to have a tailor-made experience. Um, it's not only going to perform a task, but they're part of a larger ecosystem. And the result of that 
is that uh, they're more complex, requiring all of these sensors and electronics and uh, embedded software. And it's going to make products more sticky. So if you look at, say, the iPhone and the Apple Watch, well, suddenly I'm less likely to switch to an Android device. It's, it's a great example as to how an accessory product can make your key product more sticky. So just to recap, Tesla updating itself, avoiding costly recalls, industrial machines transmitting power, consumption, and other data to serve preventative maintenance. So when you get on a plane, I was on a flight last night from Washington, D.C. to Denver, Colorado, and I was sitting over the wing looking at the jet engine. If any of you guys have heard of power by the hour and predictive maintenance, well, not only are the large airlines renting the jet engines that are in those planes and allowing to, to, for, those, for those large system integrators to provide products as a service, because we've all heard of software as a service. Now you can provide products as a service. Um, we also know that when that jet lands, if there's a piece that needs to be maintained, we can alert the maintenance facility so that part is ready, reducing turnaround time and hopefully um, avoiding a costly delay potentially at Chicago or wherever you might be, for example. And cars are being aware of their surroundings. Um, I personally don't enjoy driving on a highway or sitting in traffic. There's a lot of stress, people weaving in and out. I would really love to have the ability to have uh, some intelligence built into these automobiles to help reduce car accidents and things of that nature. And cons customers now expect hardware and products to get better over time. You know, again, that Tesla example, the iPhone, your software updates, all of this, all of this is just incredible, incredible stuff. Now this is C-Control. This is going to help you uh, understand a little bit about, you, you can apply this to your specific use case, but in, in this example, we have, a, we have a manufacturer that's looking to avoid costly downtime by leveraging data uh, in the IoT and, and democratizing uh, what can be done with our design and engineering tools. So the means of production have changed. They continue to change. We need to adapt to that. We need to be able to change with them. And you know, we want to get ahead of this, guys. We really do. So products at incredible speed, thanks to 3D laser-based additive manufacturing techniques that are now branching into metal fusion for high-strength products. Communication, you know, when we're thinking about communication, expansion and connectivity, GM working collaboratively on design projects across the globe, a local taste of culture, and more effectively be able to take up small startup companies and they can establish uh, supply chains with micro factories and uh, specialty manufacturers to better serve the, the consumer demand in those various geographies, making our manufacturing more, well, as a result, we'll need to make our manufacturing more flexible, uh, potentially automate parts of that process as well so that we can do smaller customized runs uh, that will be more cost effective. In the past, small runs are generally are associated with a higher cost of production. However, we're positioning that uh, through uh, flexible, intelligent, and somewhat automated systems, we'll be able to reduce the cost of production while serving better serving customer demand. A crowdfunding is a great example as to how anyone, anywhere, at any time, with nothing more than an internet connection and a laptop, has the ability to leverage a great idea against the collective conscience of their audience to get funding to bring that idea to market. And what does this mean? It means that you know anyone, absolutely anyone who has access to the internet and the laptop can can, can achieve this. And the product innovation platform is how they do it. And we're we're a piece of that through Inventor HSM, HSM Works, and the Fusion product and all the other great cloud products that Autodesk is bringing to market. Um, so finally, the way that manufacturers can tr consider traditional protection of their intellectual property through patents is also changing. So take Tesla, for example. They opened the IP rights on the Model S. You know, we also have uh, some product lines that have open IP. And the whole idea is, you know, you've got crowdfunding. Well, you can do crowdsourced uh, engineering as well. So. Um, let's take a look at some examples. We can work with teams virtually based on cloud solutions. We've got automations based on the Baxter robot that you 
that you'll be able to see here very soon. We've got the combination of additive and subtractive in one machine. We've got the, the, the Kickstarters of the world. If you've got an idea for a product, you can bring it to market based on this crowdfunding idea. Um, the, the massive factory that Tesla's also building, the Autodesk Ember 3D printer being open source, flexible manufacturing plants that can not only manufacture something different every day, but again, get your products closer to the consumer demand of that specific geography. So ETD, expensive, time consuming, and dangerous. You know, a lot of times we can leverage machinery to reduce some of the danger, uh, some of the uh, training time, make things a little bit more flexible. Uh, but don't get me wrong, uh, humans are still going to play an integral part of the manufacturer work of the manufacturing workspace, despite increased automation. Now, for those of you that don't know. This is the Autodesk Ember 3D printer. It's a phenomenal printer. I would highly encourage any of you that are interested in 3D printing to take a look at this. This thing is printing on uh, on a level, I think it's a, a 50 microns. I'll have to check, but just phenomenal. Think about this. You know, when was the last time anyone wanted to go clothes shopping? I personally don't enjoy a retail experience. I would much rather have the ability to design my own t-shirt and then just print it right there from my home. This is coming. This is coming. We'll be able to 3D print clothing in our home and we'll never have to worry about fit. I'm kind of in that weird size between the medium and the large, so I never know what size to get. Here, we're looking at uh, how 3D printing has the ability to save lives, bioprinting. This is here, guys. This is, this is not the distinct future. Um, this is today. And think about this. We have uh, this is over a year ago, the world's first 3D printed beating artificial heart cells. Researchers at the Wake Forest School of Medicine, they, they created this. I mean, this is, this is technology that is going to save people's lives today. We no longer have to wait for a transplant. And, and bio and nano research is something that Autodesk is heavily involved in. Um, we've got some, and that's, that's, that's really a huge part of this as well. Um, we're not just the AutoCAD company, for, for those of you that might have thought of us in that light. And so, you know, <laughs> some of you guys might be following one ear Tim on Instagram. Uh, but what we have here is a 3D printed ear made out of a, a material called Peak. And Wayne, I'm probably going to butcher this. Um, polyether, ether ketone. Did I, how did I do? Well, Wayne's, Wayne's being nice, and he's uh, not wanting to admit that I might have butchered that. But guys, Google this. P-E-E-K. It's a semi-crystalline, high-temperature uh, thermoplastic that we can basically use to uh, 3D print something like an ear and replace cartilage. Just absolutely phenomenal stuff. So product development. you know. What are the trends in, that relate to production? And this includes both the ways in which uh, designs are developed as well as how products are physically being manufactured. That collaborative tool set that allows teams to work together. Um, for those of you that might be interested in collaborating more, you might use Fusion 360, you might use A360, um, but the tools are there to work with anyone around the world at any time. So GM, for example, can work collaboratively on uh, design projects across the world. And because they have that, that collaborative environment, again, they can link their solution, they can link their product that they're manufacturing back to the consumer demand and instantly uh, you know, make those modifications to their supply chain through these micro factories that are you know, more intelligent, more automated, leveraging the data that they're producing uh, to, to have a more efficient uh, product to lower the cost of production, but then to also, since we are linking ourselves back to that consumer demand, potentially charge a premium for that product as well. So, you know, how do we get there? Well, it's all about that crowdfunding, it's all about open source, and, you know, the different manufacturing technologies and the marriage of additive and manufacturing processes today. 
I would highly encourage anyone that has a great idea to get it out there on the Kickstarter. Um, here we have some examples of some companies and some individuals that have been able to uh, disrupt established industries. Uh, Pebble's a great one. I like to think of BAC Mono because I'm a car guy. How is it possible that a group of 20 some odd engineers out of the UK were able to disrupt the supercar industry go up against the likes of Porsche and Ferrari and produce a street legal Formula One uh, race car. I mean, that is just phenomenal. Now, I could never afford one of those. But thinking about this idea of having the ability to interact with your designs, with your data in a whole new way, using virtual reality, the whole idea that you might no longer have to look at a screen and that you can interact with your world in a whole new context, well, that is coming. And if you guys haven't heard about Oculus, you definitely need to take a look at them as well. And HoloLens with V-Red. I mean, this is, a, this is an incredible wearable technology that you can leverage today. Makes me want to get outside and ride that motorbike. The, the raw computer power of cloud, cloud technology uh, let your customers manage thermal density through CFD simulation. And if you guys don't know, there is, a, there is a simulation component built inside of Fusion. You can also leverage a really incredible product called Nashtran NCAD that's inside of Inventor. It was a product developed by NASA. And this will help you validate your designs before you ever make a product so you can do your, your digital photo, your digital prototyping and save a lot of money by reducing the amount of digital prototypes that you need to make. Uh, here, we can delegate design to the computer. So some of you might have heard of generative design. Well, this is a phenomenal technology that is also here right now. I encourage all of you to go out there and, and get a trial of this technology. We're going to jump into this just a little bit. But the idea is that you know potentially the way that we're going to design something might not be the most efficient, the strongest way to do it. And what we see is that model one, 10.3 kilos. Um, we got model two, we cut it down by using some of that lattice structure, some of that 3D printing technology. And model three, this is a generative design model that we've been able to 3D print and really reduce the weight. And when we think about light weighting, there's going to be some implications of that. Uh, in various industries, aerospace is one that I'm thinking of specifically. But the idea is that the computer is choosing the uh, best options and then evaluating based on the characteristics and inputs and the aesthetic as well that we define. Um, <clears throat> for those of you that have ever flown on an airplane, that experience is going to change in our lifetimes as well. Um, we're working with Airbus, Airbus, huge, huge airplane manufacturer to not only help them design the airplane of the future, but we're going to help them make it lighter, stronger, more efficient, and more enjoyable to spend time on. Uh, what will this mean? This is going to reduce the carbon footprint of a company like uh, Airbus and all of the other companies that, that leverage their airplanes. And it's going to not only, from a business value, reduce the cost of operation, but from a sustainability value or sustainability standpoint, uh, reduce the emissions and just a, a win all around. As you guys might notice, you know, where's the pilot? Where's the cockpit? Everyone's heard of the autopilot, but this is phenomenal. I personally would love to be able to fly in a plane that has a view like this because I'm always the guy that gets the aisle or that gets the middle. Um, and I want to look out the window, and the person that gets the window has it shut, and they're tuned into their iPod. Well, this solves that problem right there. You know, we've teamed up at Autodesk uh, with Airbus to build these lightweight partitions. And these lightweight partitions are, again, serving value to not only the business line, but then showing, you know, we're just scratching the surface as to what's possible. So competitive advantage. Uh, there's increased pressure and margins and the need for innovation. But really, what does that come down to? Well, that comes down to agility. And that's really the bread and butter of Inventor HSM. Through the integrated CAD CAM workflows, we are able to um, navigate uh, these, these, these competitive landscapes in a very, very agile sense. So again, the product innovation platform. <clears throat> 
and what exactly is the product innovation platform? Well, the future of making things is going to require this. And at the heart of that product is Fusion. And this is a cloud-based technology, but you can also access some of this technology through our legacy products that are installed on your desktop clients as well. But really, um, you know, this Fusion technology is uniting all the various design disciplines. So whether it's industrial design, mechanical engineering, electronics, um, we unify all those processes in one technology. Now again, I, you know, if you're a machine shop and you need to get parts out the door, you can absolutely leverage Fusion. You can absolutely leverage Inventor HSM. You can absolutely leverage HSM Works, which is a plug-in for SolidWorks. Um, it's the same technology in all three platforms. And this is us. This is the make portion of it. So we've got design, make, and use. And through the Internet of Things, or the IoT technology and C control, that will enable us to bring all this data together and close the loop. So it's a CAD package, a CAM package, a CAE package. And again, on the CAM side of things, guys, it's the same technology on all three platforms. So regardless of what or how you want to interact with your high-speed machining software, all of this can be done through the cloud, on your desktop client, in Inventor, which is the 3D CAD modeling tool that, that is uh, competing essentially with the SOLIDWORKS platform as well. And then we integrate right inside the SOLIDWORKS platform as well. And if you consistently see, uh, we are one of the first uh, CAD CAM manufacturers to produce updates for the SOLIDWORKS platform. So it really is up to the customer to decide where they would like to work and how they would like to work. But you can leverage generative, industrial additive, 3D printing, all these connected products. And this makes up the product innovation platform, which will allow us to reduce costs, have a more sustainable use of our material, increase the strength, and ultimately provide a better product and stay closer to that customer demand. And so how does that affect us? Well, let's take a look at this workflow. Everyone's probably well aware at this point, but if you don't know, it's really the difference between integrated versus dedicated CAD CAM. So if you're not using Inventor HSM today or HSM Works or say Fusion, for example, well, your, your world is going to be the, the top up here, the standalone CAM. If there's ever an engineering change order and you know potentially there could be two or three or even four, um, Man, a lot of times you have to start from scratch. So what we're able to do is uh, really improve the workflow. What we've been seeing is an improvement anywhere between 30 and 80 percent. It really just depends on your application. Um, but just, just phenomenal that we're able to take your CAD data and just very, very quickly put toolpath on a part and post your code in any CAD what you're seeing are more and more CAD agnostic solutions from Autodesk that allow you to leverage your preferred software. And what this does is allows you to take that part model with the full solid modeling history and associativity and work on that part file right inside of your inventor product that then could potentially have NASTRAN in CAD where you could run your simulation or you could make sure that the part isn't going to break before you make it and then you can quickly put toolpaths on that part right inside of your preferred CAD tool. And here is just a general workflow of some of your uh, operations that you might find. But again, everybody, the, the, the workflow is the same in all three packages. So it's really up to you. Pay, pay, uh, pay for your cloud subscription, get your plugin for SOLIDWORKS, get a free seat of CAD when you buy Inventor HSM. You get a free seat of Inventor plus the CAM uh, portion of it for the same cost as just the CAM portion on the SOLIDWORKS platform and then you have our next generation package um, which I would highly recommend everybody to get um, to get a couple seats of just because it is so affordable and it is so amazing. Uh, but supplement, use that in addition to your Inventor HSM instance, in addition to your SOLIDWORKS instance just to be relevant to see what's coming because we're putting a lot of focus and a lot of development around engineering in the cloud and we will win that battle. And really what it's all about, what you're buying is the ability to post code quickly to your CNC machines in a format that your that they, your machines can run. And you know we, we cover this all the time, but look if anyone's going to be in Boston or San Francisco, let me know. We've got a build space 
in Boston that's a brand new facility. We're going to have Haas machines in there. We're going to be hosting high-speed machining events after IMTS all over the country. So if you have the ability to, to get in there with some of us, we'll have laptops at those events. We'll be showing people how to improve their business with high-speed machining strategies. And we'll take a look at your specific parts and see what we can do to improve your cycle times and improve your programming times to make you more efficient so you can compete in this new workplace, in this new, uh, in this new marketplace, really. So let me know. I'll get you set up with a guided tour of any of those facilities. I want to show a quick video here. Uh, this is an Autodesk Fusion promotional video. And we also have the Dellcam products as well. So what we're looking at here is Dellcam. <clears throat> it's a new acquisition that Autodesk made as of August 1st. It is now officially a part of Autodesk. And if you have the need for large-scale production environments, potentially doing uh, fourth axis wire EDM, uh, you know, or very, very advanced Swiss machining or anything like that, you're going to want to take a look at the, at the Dellcam portfolio. We also have machines that are combining uh, subtractive manufacturing with additive manufacturing as well. And I want to go back. This Fusion video didn't play, but it's, it's really, let me see if I can get it to play. Here we go. And it's all about the product innovation platform that's embodied in this product. So you can take your design, you can, you can use freeform modeling and, and push-pull to, to make changes that are very, very hard to do in traditional CAD platforms. You can, you can still capture your, your mechanical design and all of your drawings and, and bring your ideas to market. You can render them. You can use these as marketing materials. You can, you can leverage this on your, on your mobile platforms. You can collaborate with your partners all around the world. So no longer do you need to be in the same office to collaborate here. We've got the, the, the Modbot, Modbot folks <clears throat> helping out. And what you see here is here's the CAM portion. Again, guys, three ways to interact with HSM products. Inventor HSM, Fusion 360. HSM works for the SolidWorks folks. And as always, please send me an email. Let me know what you guys are doing. Send us the photos. Send us an OK that you know, you'd like us to share it on our, on our social channels. Uh, engage with us on Instagram. Engage with us on Facebook or even on Twitter. We've got a Snapchat. Um, the Snapchat's new. It's something that I've been pushing our marketing team to get involved with. Um, but we want to see what you're making and how you're leveraging Autodesk products to uh, change the world for the better. Now, Wayne, are you still with us? I'm here, Jordan. OK, so that was a lot, Wayne. I tried to rush through it as fast as possible. I hate PowerPoints. That was a 65-page 65 65, uh, deck. I would really appreciate um, getting into the software and maybe doing some quick tips and tricks around, uh, around our HSM platform. Well, what good would a uh, HSM hangout be if we weren't going to show some HSM? My thoughts, exactly. And that was a really great job, Jordan. There's a lot of good information there on the future of making things. Um, I really appreciate that, uh, the, the overview, looking at different technology that's out there and what the innovation um, uh, platform looks like. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through real quick our... Uh, our interface for Inventor. Uh, for some of you who may be new, joining us for the first time, uh, I know we have uh, some familiar faces that were some familiar names I see uh, in our list, but I'm going to walk through really quickly to give you an overview. Hopefully you can see my screen. Jordan, does it look pretty good for you? It's looking great, Wayne. Awesome. So this is Inventor, uh, a powerful 3D CAD package. It's a really good uh, source or good tool to use, uh, especially in product design. Uh, in our case, we were machinists. We work in our machines. It's a good idea to use that 3D um, uh, powerful CAD to mimic what we have going on in our machine. So in this case, I was able to download off the internet a couple of vices that I have that sit on my Haas VF2 machine. Uh, in this case, I have some orange vices, but you can find other information that you can download from the internet. 
Um, I recommend doing that, creating uh, a manufacturing template that matches the way that you work with your machine. In this case, I created a 3D um, design or, or 3D uh, representation of the way I have my soft jaw set up in my vices. I highly recommend doing that. Um, in this case, I'm going to walk through really quickly. I'm going to go and try to get some CAD to CAM. Uh, get some CAD to code within just a few minutes and show you some of the 3D tool paths that are really powerful and then touch on some of the tips and tricks in there. So working with this uh, assembly, you don't have to be, this is Inventor, you don't have to be in the assembly. Uh, it, you, you can always work on the part and open up the part itself, but I like working in the assembly because I can use these features and fixtures to actually create the soft jaws right in place. I like mimicking what I have on the machine because I can use landmarks on my fixed jaw to actually set my datum point, my G54, on that soft jaw or the fixed jaw. So things that I can actually mimic inside my 3D world, the better it's going to be in the real world. So here I'm going to work on this part. I have this set up in an assembly. Again, you don't have to be in the assembly. Um, I can open up the part itself. In fact, this is a part that was designed in SolidWorks. We do have our SolidWorks interface, but I'm going to walk through that, bring in it, and work with it in Inventor. So this part, I'm going to set it up as if I have it on the machine. I have a block of aluminum sitting in the machine. So I'm going to go into my CAM tab. So if you work with Inventor, you'll be used to the way that the Inventor interface works, where you have that in-context help when you need it. Uh, as soon as you load in our CAM, which is our HSM, Inventor HSM, you'll get a CAM tab that has all the features and functions that you'd work with the CAM side. And here we also get a CAM browser that'll keep our history. I was working earlier in a setup, but I'm going to make a new setup that we can continue to work on this part. So I'm going to do some 3D on this part. We're going to do some 3D adaptive. So what the adaptive is, is a really good roughing toolpath. Uh, it's a really good uh, algorithm for, for calculating the best way for the tool to remove the chips most efficiently. So if I do an adaptive clearing, I sl select adaptive. The one thing I love about our CAM, it's always the same workflow. For every toolpath you work with, it's always the same. Working from left to right, you have the same uh, workflow. You have the, the tool, geometry, heights, passes, and linking to work with. So in this case, I'm going to work on the 3D adaptive. Uh, adaptive. I'm going to try to clear as many of those chips away as I can most efficiently. So here I'm going to select, the, working from left to right, I'm going to select the tool. Click on the tool. It brings up the tool library. Really good library. It comes filled with a lot of sample tools that you, you can work with. I suggest you make a library of tools that you normally work with. Um, I just jumped ahead a little bit. What I wanted to show you was doing a setup before I do this. I apologize, guys. I'm going to cancel out real quick because I wanted to do a setup to show you. I do have a setup here, but I want to create a new setup. So I'm going to go up to setup. The first thing I want to do is match what I have on my machine. So I'm going to go up to setup. When I go into setup, I have a choice whether I want to work in turning or if I want to work in mill. In this case, I can choose both because it's the same exact workflow for both interfaces. It works the same way. If I choose milling, I get this rectangle. It looks at everything I have on the screen, and it gives me the minimum stock size I would need to cut whatever's in my graphics view. In this case, I don't want to cut out all of my assemblies. I only want to cut out one part. So I hit this red X, which will clear out what it's selected, and I can select simply that part that I want to do. It gives me the minimum stock size that I need to be able to cut that part out. Okay, so I'm going to go and choose my, uh, my stock size. Um, right now, I have it set up in my machine that my G54 is on a dowel pin hole on my fixed jaw. So I want to be able to set my stock size. So I'm going to put in an eighth around the part. I'll put a tenth on top, and we'll go a quarter inch into the soft jaw. As I type, you'll see it'll update right in the screen. It'll show me exactly where that is on the part. So I change that to a tenth, I make it a quarter inch, you'll see it change right there on the screen. It's complete integration between the CAD and the CAM. I'm going to say OK. Now I'm ready to do another setup. This is my setup too. Uh, I'll go into my, my 3D adaptive like I did before. There's my workflow. First step is selecting a tool. Go in and select a tool. Again, here's that library. These are, part, these are tools that I was working with in my assembly um, I call it the, my assembly um, uh, template. 
Um, these are parts that I work with that are sitting in my Haas machine. I created a library, just right click on my libraries, new library, you can create tools on the fly. You can just add a new mill tool, tell it what type of mill tool you want to use, chamfer mill, drills, flat mill, bull mills, and then you can plug in all that information you need about that tool, save it because it matches what's in my actual library. If I have a Sandvik tool or a helical tool, I can match the feeds and speeds according to the recommendation of speeds and feeds and plug it right into my library. Save it to the library and I'm building up that tool that matches what's in my tool crib. So here I'm going to select the tool that I use that's already in my library. I'm going to select this quarter inch flat roughing free flute end mill. Select it, brings it right into my graphics view so I can see what that tool is going to look like. Now, geometry. Now, the next step, I would select geometry, but I don't have to because I'm using a 3D adaptive. It recognizes right on the model itself the best place for that tool to go to remove the chips efficiently. And I'll show you more about this. I'm going to say OK. Calculates pretty quickly. I have this adaptive clearing tool path. In one place, you'll see there's a good bit of moves, but I want to show you a little bit in here. There's a spot where it's getting into these pockets right here. It's going to work its way from the outside of the stock in. I didn't have to select any geometry. It recognized on the model the best place to go. It's going to helix its way down into the material to the bottom of the pocket. And it's going to work its way out, keeping a constant chip load, keeping that same chip size the entire time as it works its way out. When it reaches these pockets where traditional tool paths would, would go in and have too much of an engagement angle, it would put a lot of chip load on that tool. Here we keep the same chip size, keeping the same load on the tool, reducing those load spikes that you would see uh, in a traditional tool pass, which would wear out your tool a lot quicker or break it. In this case, we're working in the same chip load. When it can't keep the same chip load, it backs out and comes in for another bite backs out again and comes in for another bite until it reaches the smallest bite it can take. It's going to eliminate any burial in those corners. A really good, efficient algorithm and, and good toolpath for, for clearing the chips out very efficiently. So let's take a look at that. I like to simulate it. I like to see what's going on in that model before I move on to the next step. So I click simulate, brings me into this interface, and I can hit play, and I can see what that tool is going to do. Using as much of that flute length as possible, it works its way into the part, keeping that constant engagement, the same chip size the entire time. It's going to allow you to run higher speeds and feeds because it's going to take a lot of the heat out with the chip. So running at higher feeds and speeds, you'll get the part off a lot quicker and you're running more efficient. You're also able to get a better finish on it or really close with these uh, with the adaptive clearing and you'll be able to come back and get a nice finish after you if you do the uh, 3d uh, cleanup tool pass here it's working its way into that pocket there it's going to work its way into this pocket as it works its way the another good tip that I'll show you is to be able to go into that pocket on an angle to be able to taper it down leaving some room for that swarf to come out of there some of those chips out so it's going to keep you from uh, chipping your tool, it'll your tool will last a lot longer, and it's going to be a really good, efficient way to reach those pockets in there. But in this case, I left them as a standard helix. Now it's cleaning up on those sides, on those little corners where it sees some material that was left, and we can we can limit that move around. But it picked it up right off of the model I have. Here it's working its way as it reaches the bottom of that pocket, stays in contact with that same chip size, the same chip load the entire time really efficient toolpath. One thing I can do too is we're walking through here, I can pause the toolpath and I can roll my mouse button to get a more fine toolpath so I can see what it's going to do in one particular area. So as I back the tool up, it'll recalculate and I can see a more fine simulation of what's going on. Really good way to work with your simulation engine. Okay, so that's the 3D adaptive. Cleared the part out. Let me get to the end there real quick. We can jump to the end. That's what it's going to look like after it clears out those chips and roughing. Let me close that out. So I'm going to create two more tool paths really quick. I'm going to clean out the pockets, and then we're going to clean out around the, the uh, areas that are left on the walls. So if I right-click on the adaptive, I'm going to go down here to create derived operation. So it's going to copy down the information from the tool, like the tool itself or the uh, geometry I picked if I did, any heights, any of that information, it'll copy it down 
and I can do, uh, I'm going to do a horizontal, which will face any of those horizontal faces on the part where there's stock that's left. Again, the same workflow, working from left to right, I'm going to go into my tool, I'm going to select the quarter inch finishing five flute tool, select it, brings it into the interface. Now, I can select geometry, but I don't have to because it's going to recognize on the model whatever was left for horizontal. I'm going to say OK, calculates quickly, and I have a, a toolpath that will finish on those pocket faces where I left material from my adaptive clearing. Now, I want to be able to get in those contours using the same tool, so I'm going to right-click on the adaptive clearing, create, create derived operation, I'm going to choose contour. Okay, again, I'm going to change my tool. Uh, these are really quick. I'm just clicking, just two, maybe three clicks to go through my library, and I'm going to say OK. Now, it gave me a warning, which is good. It's saying that tool I picked, the, the, um, the shoulder length and the flute length is not long enough, so therefore I might hit the shoulder. So it gives me a warning. I'm going to say yes, I'm going to accept that. But as you notice when it calculates, it gives me this little yellow check right here. It's giving me a warning right there. You'll see a little yellow check. To find out what that warning means, if you right click, okay, I'm going to go down, I'm going to say show log. That's the error log. It's going to give me that information about the warning. My flute length isn't long enough to get into some of those pockets in the area that I need to. So I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to go and make a change to my tool real quick. And I realized that's right. It's not the right flute length. I, I'm not calling up the right tool. Or I do have the right tool and I have the wrong information. So I'm simply going to go into edit, tool, select that tool, right click and edit the tool. And I can change. And yes, it's a 0.875 uh, flute length. And my shoulder length is 1.25. It's an inch and a, and a, and a quarter there. Actually, it's an inch and an eighth, so I'm going to say 1.125. I'm going to say OK. Select recalculates. When I say OK, recalculates the toolpath. Well, I'm going to recalculate it. Generate the toolpath. It's regenerating because it, that tool was used in this horizontal as well. Recalculates, and now I don't have that error anymore. So I'm able to use the 3D toolpath to be able to get my roughing, my clearing on the pockets, and my clearing in the corners for the um, the walls. Now I want to get some code out to rough it. Before I do, I want to drill these holes too. So I'm going to go up to my drill tool path. I forget what the size of the holes are. So if I hover over the hole, if you notice down here in the corner, and this is an inventor, down here I get the information on what the diameter is. So if I hover over, that's an eighth of an inch. In fact, any hole that I hover over, it'll give me the diameter feedback of what it is. So that's an eighth of an inch, so I'm going to go into my tool library, I'm going to call up my eighth inch drill, select it, brings it into my graphics environment. My next step is my geometry. I'm going to select that hole. And, and uh, if I have a plate that has 70 holes in it, and I think, man, i got to select every one of those holes, it's going to be tedious. Well, I have a function where I can select the same diameter. Automatically selects all the same diameter in the same plane. If I want to choose the height, I want to make sure it drills all the way through. So I have a function where I can say drill tip through bottom. I can give it a distance, in this case 50 thousandths. Okay, I'm going to say OK. And I didn't choose a cycle, but I just want to show you, you can set the different cycles. There's a lot of cycles that are work well on my house machine. Chip breaking cycles, tapping, reaming. Okay, I'm going to say OK, and I want to get all those tool paths. So I'm going to highlight setup to. I'm going to get a setup sheet real quick so I know how to set the tools up in my, my tool uh, carousel, my tool crib, from my crib. So I'm going to say job setup, open. And right out of the box on my other screen, I get this HTML setup sheet. It shows what the part looks like, how my stock is. There's my WCS, my G54. How many tools are used, which tools are used. My maximum feed rate, maximum spindle speed. What's the estimated cycle time it's going to take for the program? For each of those operations, which tool is used? How do I set it up? What's the length offset of that tool? And also the estimated cycle time for each of those operations. Really good setup sheet right out of the box. I'm going to close it out. Let's get some code. So I'm going to go to post process. I'm working on my Haas VF machine. 
The generic Haas host is a really good one that works well for my Haas VF. I have some switches I can use down here, whether I want sequence numbers, if I want to use G28 versus G53, uh, if I want to have subroutines, which I don't. And I can also choose if I want to have a radius versus I, J, and K. Depends on how my control is set up. I'm going to say OK and post. I'm going to save it right here in this folder. It's going to overwrite one that I already have called 1001. And that quick, I'm able to get code that I can run on my Haas VF machine. Now, before I do, um, I just realized I have to make a change to the part. So I'm going to go ahead and make a change. Um, I have a three-hole configuration. I realized, I realized that I need the five-hole configuration. This is a part that I designed in SolidWorks and brought in through AnyCAD. If I open that part in SolidWorks, this is the SolidWorks interface, and I realize that I have the three-hole configuration, I want to change that. I just open up my circular pattern. I'm going to change that to the five-hole configuration, update the part. Now I have this five-hole configuration, save it, and I notice up here, I still have the three-hole configuration, but I have this update, local update, because it still links to the part using AnyCAD. If I click the local update, it updates the part. There's my five-hole configuration. All my toolpaths went red. If I look at them, I can see they're still doing the three-hole configuration, and that's not right. And I only have three holes that are being drilled. I'll have the wrong part at the end. So if I hold Setup 2, or I just select it, Generate, and it automatically updates those 3D toolpaths to recognize the new geometry and output the five-hole configuration. And even my drills now have the five-hole configuration for each one of those links. Now I hit Setup 2, Post Process. I'm going to overwrite what I posted before, save it, and it updates to the new geometry. Now I have the five-hole configuration code to send to my machine. That quick. I'm able to make the change in another CAD system, update it right inside of Inventor. I could make the change in Inventor. It'll work the same way. That CAD to CAM integration, direct integration, updated my toolpaths automatically. I didn't have to select any geometry. And now I have the code that I can run in my machine. Now, somebody had asked earlier if we can look at verifying this code in the editor. So I'm going to do that now. The editor that comes with our HSM, is a really good editor. It has a lot of information to help drive the, the, uh, the code that you're working with. If I go to backplot, and I can use a backplot window, and I can backplot and verify each line of these of code before I send it to the machine. So this is going to walk through each line of code so I can see if that tool goes anywhere it's not supposed to. Um, I know I have to go back and make some changes. As you can see, it's the five-hole configuration, so I know I have the right code. And I know my part was updated correctly. And I can walk through that code like this and verify and make sure before it goes to the machine that it's correct. It looks good. So before I go and put this on my USB to send it to my Haas machine, I'm going to close out of Backplot. Go back up. Check my code. Looks good. And now I can save it. Okay, and I'm just going to go File. I'm going to go back into Editor and Save As. And I can save it right on my thumb drive bring it over to my machine and run that part. So within a few minutes, I think we started, I guess it's been 15 minutes, but generally we can get there really quick. Um, but I can get, be able to put 3D toolpaths. I didn't have to select anything on the model. Every toolpath had the same workflow, really easy to, to use and be able to find like passes. I can change, you know, what's my stepping, my, my step over. I can add step over information. Always easy to find my way. Adaptive, the same workflow. My passes, there's my optimal load. I can go in here and edit the expression that drives my optimal load really quickly. So I can find my way around. So passes are what controls as the tool is cutting. Heights, I can control where I want the bottom height of my tool to go. I can make it an offset from the bottom of the model. I can also make it an offset from the top face of my soft jaw and make it uh, 50 thousandths above my soft jaw. So really quick and easy to use. Color, co color coordinated heights that we can work with, our clearance height.
really easy to use. Going back into my geometry, I can select different geometry off the model as boundaries, and I can also go back and change my tool. Recalculates quickly. I have the new step over on the model or the new optimal load. So that quick, I'm able to make changes, update the part itself, update the parameters, and be able to get that code. Really easy to use. That's part of the innovation of working with our HSM. Super easy to use interface and complete CAD CAM integration. So that's all I wanted to show you today, real quick as we walk through. And we had some great information that Jordan walked through as he talked about the future of making things and where Autodesk is heading in the future. Uh, talked about our, our Fusion product, uh, talked about Inventor HSM, and talked about HSM Works, which is our plugin for SolidWorks. Um, all have the same uh, engine that works behind them, the same cam you'll find throughout all the products. Same easy to use interface, the same integration between the CAD and the CAM world. Really, really good technology as far as the CAM side and the make uh, part is going with HSM. So Jordan, um, I'm going to hand it back to you. I don't know if you do you have any other slides you'd like to show or is there any other information we'd like to share? No, man, that was really great. Um, you know, I guess I'd like to I'd like to just alert everybody about a couple of things. So uh, could you pull up a browser? Um, I say it's the Google Chrome browser. Let's let's show everybody the Autodesk Education Program. So sure. uh, yesterday or two days ago, rather, I had the honor and the privilege of visiting the Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. Phenomenal facility, phenomenal program, and it was all because of this. Autodesk EDU community. So for those of you that have friends and family that are students, um, please alert them that they can get the majority of Autodesk products and free licensing of those products. You can get Fusion, you can get Nastran, you can get Inventory to Sam, uh, you can get T-Splines for Rhino. I mean, there's so many different things that Autodesk is doing from CAD agnostic solutions uh, to um, cloud-based uh, CAE, CAD CAM workflows. I mean, it is a phenomenal world that we're entering into, but education is a huge part of my life. It's a huge passion. I know Wayne feels the same way. So please, if you have friends and family that are current students or if they're educators, we will go into your school and we will outfit your entire lab with free software. This is a you know, a business that used to generate a few hundred million dollars a year that Carl Bass, our incredible CEO, decided to give back to the world and enable students and educators to have access to incredible technology for free. And I'll tell you, the majority of the competition out there charges these educational institutions, treats them like profit centers. And you know, I don't know if that's right or not, but personally, while you're a student, there's no better time in your life to ask for help. And I know if a student ever sends me an email, I bend over backwards to help that individual. So this is one great resource. Just Google Autodesk Education. It's autodesk.com slash education slash free dash software slash all. That's truly really what it is, free software for all. Um, Wayne, maybe the Autodesk Knowledge Network? Yeah, actually, I do want to go there um, and talk about that because I think a question just popped up. Uh, I'm going to go and do a search for Autodesk Knowledge Network. So a great resource to find uh, any help and support when you're learning and working with our, our um, interfaces. Um, we have a great community to work with. You can search in here if you have any questions. Um, one of the questions that looked like it came up was uh, if, if HSM Works will ever have nesting added on. Now, uh, there was a question that came up some time ago for our developers, uh, whether we could be able to integrate some of the true nest and some of the other nesting capability uh, into HSM Works, uh, even the other HSM products. And it was put on the table, and I know that developers were looking at what it would be, uh, the bang for the buck of adding it into HSM Works and Inventor. Um, and I don't think it went too far as as to the roadmap on our developers' um, um, uh, 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 or shall I say uh, uh, goals or milestones of a roadmap. Now we do have in our uh, forums is an idea station. Um, we're going to look at this. I'll show you the search here too. But if we go into cam.autodesk, 
www.ecofactor.com, another great site to find information. Uh, if you look in here, we have our partners, but we have our forums for CAM. And in here is a place where you can put and you can vote. We have our idea stations. HSM Ideas is a great place on our forum. If you would plug in, uh, you can type what you'd like to see. If you're looking for nesting inside of HSM, um, enter that into the idea station, and then people will vote on it. If there's enough votes for your idea, then it will make it onto our developer's roadmap, and we'll get more feedback. You'll see more feedback inside the forum as to where it lies, that idea. Um, we ha we've had some that are put in uh, on a Monday, and the next Monday we see it was it's already been in you know the, uh, the, the, the milestone. It's already in there as far as the next development the update. So there are some places, of course, you can see, uh, if you look in our support, look in some of our um, our, our forums uh, entries in here and do some search in our forum, you'll see a lot of those tools, uh, bugs, places where people have already submitted information, um, training information as well, a great forum to find answers uh, in, in HSM, uh, Inventor HSM Works. So if you go to uh, forums or just go to our cam.autodesk.com site and click on forums, Another great, as we talked about, Autodesk Knowledge Network, you can do a search in here. You don't have to have a particular product or if you're looking for all products. If you search in here HSM, right, just look at HSM or you can type in HSM Works and do a search right in our Autodesk Knowledge Network, you'll see a plethora of information, reference information, videos, how to get started, tips and tricks, working through as you're learning uh, HSM. Okay, so this is a great resource. Again, if you go into our cam.autodesk.com site, you'll see links to learning resources, tips, events, our weekly webinars, the one you're on today is listed in here. Uh, we also do our weekly webinar uh, for Wednesdays, which is our Kickstarter webinar you can sign up for. Other events, uh, upcoming events, tips and tricks, you'll find in here, and learning. Another great resource is looking at our CNC handbook, and you can also get tutorials directly in here working with Inventor as well as Fusion and HSM Works. Really good, helpful resource right here. So you have the Autodesk Knowledge Network, our cam.autodesk.com site, okay, and also our, in the education, anybody working in education, as Jordan had mentioned, you can get all of these uh, software interfaces, all of our products, these products it listed here for free uh, for your education uh, facility. Hey, Wayne. Yes. Uh, you know, there's one other thing that we, well, a couple other things that we give away for free um, as well that people should know about, and that's kind of a, you know, it, it can be a bit of a pain in the butt sometimes. It's it's the posts for your CNC machine. So if you go to cam.autodesk.com slash posts, not only can you access uh, all of the recent posts and you can search for them by whatever machine you're using, but look guys, we, we just believe that this needs to be free and included where a lot of the competition is charging today. We're just going to include that. So you're running Haas, you're running a milling machine, you can search by the type, you can search by the manufacturer, you can just type it in. There's quick tips, you can see when they've been updated, um, but then again, if you know JavaScript, for example, all of, all of our posts are open, so you, so you can go in there and you can modify them exactly how you need to be, how they need to be for you. If you don't know JavaScript and you want to have those modified, um, our reseller channel is, is great. They can, they can help you with that as well. Looks like, uh, thanks Jordan, and I was just going to say, it looks like we got another question in there. Um, so the question was, can we set up a solid model uh, so we can post out and set the spacing when running multiple parts in the same program. So if you do this in, in, the, uh, in, in the, uh, the assembly, you can do this pretty quickly. I just want to show you, if I wanted to take the adaptive and the horizontal and contour, I could take them all, and I wanted to put them on this other part. You can do something like this. You can do a pattern. You could do a linear pattern, select a direction for the linear pattern, and you could say, I want, you know, two of those instances, and I want it to be four inches away. You could do something like that, where you could pattern as many as you want. So if I wanted to pattern, let's say, 
you know, five instances of the same part, I can pattern that so the code, when I post it out, I'll have my G54, and according to that G54, we'll post out the code. I can also set it up with multiple, uh, multiple WCS in here. Now, another way to do it, if you're working in the assembly, you don't have to use a linear pattern. As many times as you have that same component in your assembly, you can do a component pattern. So if I want to do a component pattern, I'm going to say, take all the same toolpaths that are on this part and put it on that part over there. I just have to apply this as the source. I just select the source as this. It knows all the toolpaths that are on that part, duplicated them onto the other part. So I don't have to tell it the distance. It recognizes it right from the assembly. Okay, I can order it by tool, and I can order it by operation. Okay, I'll do it by operation, say OK. So now when I go to post out that pattern of those tool paths, um, I'll see that it'll post out. That's a lot of code, so I'm going to probably just do, I'll, I'll pattern this, uh, this drill real quick so we can see the code. So I'll do another pattern just of the drill. Um, I'll include the drill. Well, well, that's OK. So let me post this out. I'll go to post process, post it out, save, yes, update it, and I can see where the next tool change is. So there is my first part, my adaptive two. Um, it'll, out, it'll output the code. Let me go find my next M3. I think I can do it this way. Find next M3. And I can see that pattern where it moves that horizontal and it goes out. Well, the M3 is not going to work. That's the only time when I do a tool change. But I can show you I could post out that code uh, for each of those uh, pattern, each of the pattern parts. Um, and I can take a look at this also. Um, I should be able to do it this way as a backplot, backplot window, and I can see I have multiple parts in my backplot window. So it does that operation, then the code goes over here and does that operation. So I didn't do a tool change except to, to, to do two, two tool changes on the, uh, on the horizontal and the contour. But as you can see, it's going to output the code for both of those parts. Hopefully that answered your question. That's how you would set up to do multiple parts in your program, is you can do it by a pattern. That's awesome. Wayne, thanks for that. Hey, how are we doing on time? I know we're a little over. Um, for anyone in the audience, this is, this is your opportunity. Um, you've got Wayne and myself here right now. You've got any question that you've been struggling with with the HSM products, uh, let us know. Submit those. Um, We'll, we'll do our best to get them answered. If not right now, um, we, we do circle back and look at those and get those questions addressed. Or if we can't personally do it, um, we have someone else on the team or have someone else in the reseller channel handle those questions. Awesome. So yeah, I mean, uh, Wayne, what do you think? If there aren't any more questions, I'll ask one more poll. Um, in the meanwhile, Get your questions ready. Get those asked if you have anything you want to want us to cover. Um, I always like asking this: What's the likelihood that your company is ready to reduce programming and cycle times and improve profit margins with HSM? I'll tell you, I was on site with the customer. Um, we've reduced their uh, programming and cycle time by 30 percent, and we also uh, reduced their training time uh, by 80 percent. So basically, that meant that. It didn't take them eight weeks anymore to basically become a beginner. Uh, just phenomenal stuff so that really <clears throat> you can go out into the workplace and you can hire somebody that's smart and that has talent and has potential. You don't need to be locked into somebody who has past experience with a product that is um, more inefficient and doesn't have these integrated CAD CAM workflows. So really it's all about reducing that cost per part aligning your manufacturing capabilities with consumer demand and what's driving the marketplace today and having the ability to adapt and be agile in that marketplace. So thank you so much everybody for voting. We certainly appreciate it. And Wayne, interesting here, um, we got about 10% of the crowd today wants to see a quote. 8% um, looks good, wants to talk to the boss. Uh, 0% loves their punching bag. That's good. In the weeks past, we've had a few boxers in the room. Uh, and 75% of the audience today is already using HSM Works and Inventor HSM. And that's really the reason why we do these things, guys. Um, 
It's all about helping you be successful and adopting the product and, and staying uh, on top of not only industry trends but what's relevant and helping each other out. That's what we see with the forums. That's why those communities are so successful. That's why we um, love seeing all your Instagram posts. So tag Run CNC, tag HSM Works, Inventor HSM, uh, tag Autodesk MFG, whatever you got. And interesting, uh, the, another minority in the group, 8% would rather manually select geometry with HSM Express, and that's great. Um, you know, we thank you guys. We thank everybody for using that free product. Um, if you know a friend that is using SolidWorks or Inventor and they, you want to give them some free uh, CAM software, uh, we support three previous versions on the development build, but I know that it'll, HSM Express will run on older versions. We've even seen it running as, on versions as old as uh, six years back. So um, spread the word. Let us know. We're also going to be launching a referral program here in the future, so look forward to that. And um, Wayne, any questions you want to address before we sign off? Um, I think it, there's, it looks good. I think one of the same uh, gentleman was asking if we can verify um, our program as a solid model uh, in the back plot. And so uh, we do have a product that's inside of our HSM Works, uh, which is being able to do machine sim. Um, that's only in HSM Works today. It's not an inventor, and it's not in our Fusion product. But it's a plugin that that simulates, but it doesn't use the post-processor code. It still uses what we call as the NCI data, the um, generic data that runs behind the cam that outputs the code for NC code, for ISO code. Um, but that is um, machine sim, and it's only in HSM Works, uh, if that answers your question, John. Awesome. Well, um, Wayne, thank you for joining us. Everybody that's still on, we have quite a few people. Thank you so much uh, for coming. Uh, remember, same place, same time, next week, new content. But really, next week is IMTS. So what do we got to do? Send me an email if you're going to be there. Uh, if you want to get involved, if you want to come to the VIP party, uh, I'll get you tickets for that. If you want to get a free ticket to IMTS and you can definitely be there, let me know. I'll hook you up with that. Um, we've got the Haas Autodesk Party. It's never been done before. We want to show Haas how strong the HSM community is. So you're running a Haas machine. You're using HSM. You're going to be in the Chicago area. You're going to stop by IMTS. Let me know. I will get you in on that party. We're going to have free beer, free food. It's going to be a phenomenal event. Unfortunately, I won't be there, but you'll get to meet Wayne. You'll get to meet Matt Nichols. You'll get to meet One Ear Tim on Instagram, Instagram Tim Paul. You'll get to meet Adam Smith, Joe Bailey, Al Watmo. Everybody on the team is going to be there, but i got to stay behind and man the ship. So uh, enjoy Chicago, everybody, and we'll see you next week. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week.